I'm going to talk about how I wrote my last book. I turned the manuscript in about five days ago. Thanks. It's called The Bulletproof Diet Book. And I was going to self-publish this thing. And about two months ago, an agent said, hey, Dave, you really should like go talk to publishers. And I said, eh. So she kind of wrote the proposal to help me and, and things like that. And all of a sudden, I had the largest book deal of my life land in my lap, two weeks from when I didn't think I'd have a book deal. And they gave me about six weeks to come out with a 70,000-word New York Times best-selling book. <laughs> Hasn't been released yet, just so we're clear. On top of that, I had three trips where I was giving talks like this one, already scheduled where I'd made commitments. So I ended up compressing, oh, around 70% of the work that was remaining on the book into six nights. I'm going to talk about the technology I used to do that, because it wasn't just me. I'm known for biohacking and hacking the human body and brain. I know my most creative writing time is in the middle of the night. It's not that good to stay up all night every night. What I ended up doing was pulling five all-nighters in a row and sleeping two and a half hours a day in mid-morning, because that's kind of how I roll when I'm getting into the creative flow state for writing. But how do you maintain your energy when you're doing that? I wanted to be undisturbed. I wanted to have this ability to pull all of this knowledge and assemble these different things together. So I wrote a Facebook post about it, saying, here are some of the technologies I used. And they're not what you think. Of course, Bulletproof Coffee was involved around 11 PM. And the reason for that, well, coffee keeps you up, duh. On top of that, though, the extra oil that's added does create ketones, which fuel brain cells. Actually, brain cells prefer ketones to sugar. Some of the cells do. So I had my brain running on both carbs, because I did consume a, a source of clean starch, and I consumed MCT oil at the same time. So I had more energy than normal. But how did I get into the state I wanted to be in? One of the things I did is I hooked electrodes to my temples, and I ran a shaped current, a very small current. This is called cerebral electrical stimulation. It was developed for the Russian space program. It used to be called the Russian sleep machine. This really cool technology was based on the idea that it's expensive to send astronauts to space because you need a lot of fuel. What if you just made them sleep less? You could send less astronauts. Like, it's the ultimate Russian logic, and it's accurate. <laughs> so. I ran a gamma current, which correlates actually very well with writing. Uh, it was actually 57.5 hertz if you're a brain hacker and you're interested in such things. And I did that for about 90 minutes a night, which always improves my writing and always helps. But I want more blood in my brain, more oxygen, more mitochondrial activity. So I used supplements that increase that. And aside from the electrical current, I also used a laser that I shined onto my brain. It turns out, since about 1997, I've used either a very strong infrared illuminator or a laser on occasion to help my brain mitochondria grow. This one's a violet laser, and you can hold it over the visual center in your brain. And believe it or not, it actually raises alpha in the brain, and it raises metabolic activity. It's also an unfocused laser, so it's not poking holes in my eyes or yours. But I did this for five nights straight. I actually took cortisol as a supplement. Cortisol is the death hormone, right? Except if you don't have enough cortisol, you can't perform and you die. So it's not the death hormone. Like every other hormone in your body, including serotonin and testosterone and estrogen, too much bad, too little bad. So when we demonize a hormone <laughs> like cortisol or any other substance like, oh, say, cholesterol, low cholesterol makes you weak. And high cholesterol, well, depending on what it's doing, you can measure its effect. But there's a certain limit where it's really bad, but it's way higher than common knowledge would say. So interestingly enough, here I am. I've increased the blood flow in my brain. I've increased the electrical activity in the brain. I've raised alpha and gamma in my brain. And all of this helped me write. But I'm still sitting there for a long period of time. So what else did I do? 
I have an electric controlled standing desk called Stand Desk, which is a Kickstarter thing. You press a button and you're standing up. I actually spent most of the time standing up because it worked really well. But you still get a little bit tired. So I have this really cool spiky mat. It's called a sleep induction mat. And I actually use it to go to sleep faster and deeper. But if you stand on it, it activates the acupuncture nodes in your feet. So I'm standing on really sharp spikes at a standing desk, <laughs> dictating with electrodes on my head, occasionally holding a laser here, drinking coffee, and kicking ass. <laughs> there is more to it, though, because I wanted even more blood in my brain without an aneurysm. So every half hour, I would go to the whole body vibration plate that I used to basically strengthen my, my muscles and my, uh, my bones. And I would do a handstand with my feet against the wall, plant my hands on it, and vibrate for about one minute, 30 times a second, which is from the American space program, because 30 times a second is the frequency that they realize would increase bone density in astronauts, because astronauts have bone density problems. So doing that upside down, though, you think doing a handstand brings blood to your head. It does. In fact, you can increase the capillaries in your brain by hanging upside down. It's a well-known thing. Or you can spend time at the bottom of a swimming pool, but there's no air down there. That's the problem. So either of those techniques work, but what I was doing there was basically just making sure I had a lot of circulation going and telling the meat in my body, uh, you're not going to sleep now. You are doing everything humanly possible to power this. And I cranked through the book. When I sent it into the publisher, they said, we really, really like it. It's really good. And the publisher is Rodale. And I was in New York two days ago, three days ago, whenever that was, and uh, met with the president of Rodale and everyone else. And the feedback, I'm assuming it's correct feedback, was, wow, it looks really good. We really like this. We haven't seen this before. Like, like it meets our expectations. Either that or they're pumping me up because I'm a, an author. I have no idea. But I like to think it was good. Uh, and I'll tell you after December 2nd when it launches, <laughs> and we see the sales numbers and the feedback on Amazon, which, speaking of feedback, this is one of the most important things you can get, whether you're a writer or whether you're using any of the technologies I just thought about. Because the end of the day is, is did the technologies work? And let's talk other technologies. Smart drugs. I took smart drugs, I admit it. In fact, I've taken smart drugs for most of the last 15 years. I was on ProVigil for eight years straight, modafinil it's called. How many of you have seen Limitless, the movie? I'm guessing every hand is going to go up in here, just about. I would bet a lot that the cameramen in Limitless, or the producers at least, used modafinil as part of their, uh, part of their process for making the movie. The reason I know it is that when you take modafinil, colors get more saturated, just a little bit. You don't notice, notice it normally, but at Christmas, you really notice it. Because as Christmas lights, you're like, damn, those are bright. Like, those are the best Christmas lights I've ever seen. And it's actually because your brain gets so much faster on modafinil that you have time to perceive things that you might not otherwise perceive. And when you take this every day, your natural state becomes faster. You get used to that. And surprisingly for the book, I didn't use modafinil because I've decided about oh, a year and a half ago that I was going to see what happened if I didn't use it for a while. And I've been on like CNN and Nightline talking about this. And I know hundreds of people whose lives have been changed by being able to use their brain at their full capacity because biologically they weren't able to do it. But I didn't use that one. What I did use, though, was something called aniracetam. This is a class of drug, or it's a member of a class of drug called the, the racetam family. The oldest one is 50 plus years old called paracetam. But aniracetam is fat soluble, and it's the only one of the racetams that increases memory I.O. And as a former computer science guy and computer hacker sort of guy, I.O., the ability to get things in and out of a system faster. So if you take a drug that actually has neuroprotective properties, it's one really side effect is that it amplifies caffeine. Oh, no. Well, I actually believe it's an anti-aging substance as much as it is a smart drug. So I took that. So when I'm looking for a word, the word is there, and I can bring it up. By the way, have I said um yet? I haven't said um one time. I'm on aniracetam right now. Is my memory I.O. a little higher than it would have be otherwise? It is. And that kind of ability, 
to have that available all the time. I track every single day if I cannot find a word. If I go to the refrigerator and open the door and say, why was I here? I lived that way for many years, where half the time I couldn't remember exactly what it was I was doing. And because of smart drugs, because of proper nutrition, because of basically biohacking, because of electrical currents and lasers, it doesn't happen. And I know I did something wrong, and it's my fault, because I chose to do whatever that was if I cannot remember a word. It means my system wasn't optimized. It doesn't mean I'm a bad person. It just means, hmm, that's a signal. It's biofeedback. And for you to get a signal for whatever it is you're doing, to know, am I doing it as well as I could be doing it, or as well as I want to be doing it, is really important. The other piece of advice that's really important here is, you don't have to do everything perfectly. Whether it's writing a book, my book isn't as perfect as I'd want it to be, because it would take me 10 more years, and there could still be one more tweak. But you want to do things as well as you want to do them. The problem that we run into is when we try to do something, this well, but we only do it this well. What happened there? Well, maybe you just don't have the skills yet. And that's fine, because you can measure and learn and say, all right, I'm going to figure out how to get up to the level I want to be. But when you know you could do it this well, you've done it before this well, and you only hit this well, something happened. And the fact that there's a gap is one of the most important signals you can pay attention to in your life. And whether that is, I wanted to sit down on the couch without my back hurting, because it didn't hurt the last two weeks, but it hurts this week, what did I do differently? It's that question, what's different, that drives biohacking and drives most human progress. So pay attention to it, and if you have the opportunity, using cool little bits of technology, like these little trackers that can tell you the number of steps you took or how well you slept or anything else, if you have the opportunity to tell your nervous system how well you did, in real time, you can get amazing amounts of performance. So if your brain is drifting, a computer can tell you that your brain is drifting and teach you to make it drift less. And that's also been part of the process that I used to prepare myself for writing, which is neurofeedback. Let's talk about other smart drugs. Phenylparacetam. In fact, my favorite stack is, then the one I used for writing was aniracetam, is kind of a daily thing for me. I also take phenylparacetam, which you can buy online. It's legal. Phenylparacetam provides more energy in the body and a little bit more focus in the brain. It's a bit more stimulating, and it's great in combination. The other one is called oxiracetam. So it turns out there's a bunch of the racetams, and depending on which one you take, you might really, really do well uh, to try one of those. You might choose to take it every day. You might choose to take it only for specific tasks. The editors of Rolling Stone talked with me uh, uh, last year sometime, and they ran a piece on smart drugs. And they tried modafinil, and they tried aniracetam, and they tried a couple other things. I, I'm actually not remembering what they were. And at the, like, like a nutritional supplement thing, it's kind of funny, I'm forgetting smart drugs. It, it was just ones that I don't take on a regular basis. It might have been Siltep which is another one I'm a fan of, and one I actually was taking. Uh, and it might have been Alpha Brain, and you'll hear from Aubrey, who's like the guy who created Alpha Brain. Um, but I just don't remember in the article because it wasn't something I chose to store. So this, this article, at the end of the article, he said, well, of all these things, including modafinil, which is like the poster child for like, you know, testosterone for the brain sort of thing, he said Anorastam was his favorite one that he wanted to take every day, and the other ones he'd use for special occasions. And that's kind of an interesting thing. When you look at how you could amplify the performance of your brain, and I don't mean amplify performance at the cost of your health or the cost of aging or Alzheimer's. I mean amplify performance because a brain that works better is a healthier brain kind of amplification. The stack that I tend to look at first comes from nutrition. You, you want to eat a high, healthy fat diet without lots of things that make you inflamed. The Bulletproof Diet infographic stuff is free. My recommendations, there are man, there's many of them. So we're not going to go through that today. But on top of that, about two thirds of people benefit from increasing the levels of choline in their brain. Choline is what makes acetylcholine one of the stimulating neurotransmitters. The other third of people, when they get acetylcholine, it actually makes them stressed and they get muscle cramps from it, which is, or headaches, which is a problem. So you need to know what kind of brain you have. After you go there, though, you can also look at something called 
chemically induced long-term potentiation, which is something you do with Siltep. Siltep is a combination of artichoke extract combined with coleus forscolin, which is an Ayurvedic herb. And I think my friends at Natural Stacks are they're on that side. This is another one of those smart drugs, although it's technically a supplement, not a drug, because drugs have certain rules and all that stuff. Only drugs can cure things. Supplements can't cure anything. It's illegal for a supplement to cure things, remember. <laughs> it, it's amazing what you can do with these things. But if you are like a typical person who hasn't spent a lot of time monitoring how you're thinking, monitoring your consciousness and your awareness, what you may find is you may find that you took it and not much happened. And here's the trick. Take it every day for a week and see what happens. The first time I took paracetam 15 years ago, I took it because my brain wasn't working well. It was actually starting to, I would say, fail because of some health problems I was dealing with. And I said, damn it, I bought this stuff from Europe. It was like 75 bucks. It took three weeks to get here. And I took it and nothing happened. And I was so mad. When I quit taking it, I realized, hey, I had to think of that. My brain is slower. So it feels so natural when your brain starts working all the way that you oftentimes don't notice it, unless it's a big change. So then when you do the old habits that were causing the level of performance that you think is normal, you get the realization that, wait, last week I was working better, and I only noticed because I lost the performance. But the gain in performance feels so good and so natural, like, ah, I'm just more of myself. This is how it should be. So getting a little process running in your brain that says, what is a smart drug doing to me? What is this new stack of nutrition doing, not just for how I sleep or anything like that, but could I pay attention all day long? Did I remember everything today? Did I forget my car keys? Because it's those little things that really change how you perform. Those are your signal that tells you how you're doing. And smart drugs are one way to address that. The other one is sleep. If you search the Bulletproof Executive site for sleep hacks, most of what I'm going to share with you is written down. And I may throw a few other things in that I've been meaning to write down. Sleep hygiene is something I do with my clients. My clients are, there's only a few of them because I'm a CEO and a blogger and a podcaster. And uh, by the way, Bulletproof Executive, the podcast, is now going to be a nationally syndicated radio show in about a month. Kind of cool. Um, oh, thank you. So that's taking even more time. But with my coaching clients, who tend to be very successful executives or Hollywood types who are just looking for a little bit of an edge, one of the first things I say is, how do you sleep? And the two problems that most people have is, number one, it takes me a while to go to sleep because my mind is running. And well, there's a hack for that. There's actually a whole bunch of them. But most of them actually aren't sleep hacks specifically. My experience is that my mind always ran all day long when I went to sleep. <laughs> and it actually wasn't saying very nice things most of the time. And now the voice in my head is pretty much my bitch. <laughs> and it feels good. Because I can say shut up, and it actually will. And I can also listen to it when it has something intelligent to say. That comes from consciousness expanding things, things like float tanks, neurofeedback, uh, shamanic ceremonies, things like that, where you end up really focusing uh, you know, Buddhist monastery stuff. So you can learn awareness that will drive sleep habits. But if you're not going to go down that path, and a lot of people won't and never will, what would you do? Well, deep breaths before sleep? They don't teach you this as a child. <laughs> so you're laying there trying to sleep, and you do whatever you're going to do, but you just fall asleep. No, you can actually go to sleep, which is different than falling. And one of the ways you can do this is called a box breath. And it's something really, really simple. And I can guide you through it now. But for you, you're going to change the side of each side of the box. And the way it works, if you want to do this, you can exhale. So exhale, and, and then we inhale on one side of the box. We'll do about five second inhale slowly. Hold for five seconds. Exhale slowly for five seconds. Now hold empty for five seconds. All right. Now do 10 of those before sleep, or as you're trying to go to sleep, and you'll find it works really well. You may have 10 seconds per side. 
Um, I can do 20 seconds per side, although that bottom end gets pretty tough at 20 seconds. But the reason this works is because the part of your mind that races is actually more of a primordial part of your mind that worries about stuff. And it worries an awful lot about not having any air. <laughs> <laughs> and when you show it that you're in charge, because you're controlling how fast it goes in, how fast it goes out, and that you're going to sit there with your lungs empty for a little while, it goes, ah! And then eventually it gives up, and that's when you go to sleep. So that's a cool sleep hack that I haven't exactly elucidated on there. How much sleep do you need? We'll answer that question. Um, I've had, for the past 450 days, five hours and 58 minutes of sleep on average per night, according to one of the two monitoring systems I have. The other one says less. The study that I think has the most credibility says that the people who live longest get six and a half hours of sleep per night. That's not to say sleep less to live longer. What it says is that healthy people need less sleep. And that I know is true. Because when people make health changes, they need less sleep. It's amazing what happens. However, if you're trying to recover from something or get stronger, you might want to get more sleep. <laughs> so sleep is good for you. And it's very much a balance between your activity levels, your stress levels, and how much sleep you get. But don't shorten your sleep artificially unless you're also maybe reducing exercise or reducing stress or otherwise accounting for it. So for me, six hours, but I've done five hours or less straight for two years as an experiment. And all the tests I could get, there was no harm that was done from that, including neurological tests, uh, nervous system tests of my heart function and autonomic nervous system function, and hormone level tests. So it's possible to sleep less for long periods of time without killing yourself. That said, you're going to hear more 12-minute uh, talk later today. This is entirely impromptu, and thank you all for listening.